You know, Grace Wells Bonner, just such a glorious designer. I mean, there are certain designers who I think are kind of born for the time within which they live. And I, and I think about um, my Elsa Schiaparelli, you know, that gorgeous kind of body of work, those wonderful dresses that just seem to define that moment in fashion, um, it, during which we were kind of traveling through recession during the interwar years, but her glamour, it just seemed to suggest the possibility of some, something else. Or wandering around Night Fever, which you've just had a look at, and it just reminded me of Halston, those glorious dresses that you probably saw that amazingly kind of glittery one, particularly, that that was part of a collection that I think sort of redefined the possibilities of the 70s New York club um, um, scene, to do that through a dress. And, you know, I also think of someone like um, Alexander McQueen, who, at the turn of the millennium, it's his work, I think, more than anyone else's, who seems to define and capture that period of angst. And I think these are more than clothes designers. They crafted collections which didn't follow and reflect. They crafted a kind of fashion which actually drove thinking and discourse, crafted new ways for us to understand the world around us. And I would place Grace Wales Bonner in that very elite group of designers with a very special kind of antenna. In, in early 1996, I was very lucky. It was just after McQueen had joined Givenchy. And I was asked by, I managed to get by, by a TV company to make a film about him. And I met his neighbor, um, Karl Lagerfeld at Chanel. And I asked him what he thought of this new neighbor, this new neighbor in Paris, this luminous talent who'd just taken over the helm of, an, of a rival atelier. And after, in his very kind of charismatic and elegant way, welcoming McQueen to Paris, and he praised his astounding gifts, Lagerfeld, he delivers this absolutely beautiful coda, as only he was actually able. And he said, that he saw great design as having the particular potential to map both the past and the future, to act simultaneously, as he put it, and I remember this very well, as both archaeology and oracle, to operate as a kind of temporal lens with the power to lo locate and connect us. And as he spoke, I was reminded of something that I hadn't read for more than a decade. It was the piece of Jacques Lacan in, that he wrote in 1964. And he talked about the very best art, the best of creativity, having a kind of prophetic quality. He argued that the best art, it can offer us glimpses, not just of the past, but of the future. Read well, it can suggest a very kind of particular set of cultural mechanics that can open portals that can offer us ways of looking across temporal realities. And I, I, th I mean, these are kind of compelling ways of thinking about culture. As culture is a lens for understanding ourselves, our heritage, and our future. And I've always believed that beyond the kind of in extrinsic value for the benefit of culture that we so often talk about, there lies a kind of rich hinterland that we don't so often explore. And I think that is the area that fashion is so good at interrogating. Helping us to understand things about ourselves, things we'd like to hide, but also things that we would choose to reveal. And it's it's a way in a, of placing us on the couch. But doing it when we might not actually be prepared. 
And it's rarely just a kind of a shield, a carapace. It's more like a burnished lens through which we can actually steal beautiful views to our psyches. We can open up vistas across time and geography and gain very special perspectives on shift, the shifting plates which underpin culture. And it's a two-way lens, a lens with the capacity to reveal something not just about the personal, but also with the power to cast light on ambient attitudes and aspirations. And great designers like Grace Wells Bonner, they don't just deliver brilliant, beautiful, exquisitely crafted and glorious engi gloriously engineered designs. Through their clothes, I believe that we can read and we can map the wider context in ways that few other creative disciplines offer us an opportunity to, to do. They craft complex compasses through which we can re-navigate the world. And today, we have the incredible privilege to look at both sides of that lens, to both reflect on her work, work of a truly singular talent, but also to delve a little deeper into the well of the context of all of those sorts of inspirations and all of the things that she thinks about as she designs this gorgeous work we can delve into as we talk to her. We can delve into the terrain of Grace's incredible imagination. In my mind, it's the critical intellectual territory of this time. And she, any of you who know her work, that it encompasses so many nascent things and does so, so poignantly. Race, identity, gender, equity, ideas of beauty. And so for me, she's developed a body of work, of thinking, that probably more successfully than any of her contemporaries offers us the very particular and necessary tools to, to, to navigate the complexities of this particular moment. And I'm looking forward to speaking to Grace. But before I do, I just, as someone of African descent, I just wanted to say something about what her work means to me personally. Could we go on to the next image, please? I was born like Grace in South London. And, and you know, I know the neighborhoods that she would have called home. And I grew up with an, a very powerful understanding of what textiles could be. That my brother was a fashion designer. My aunts would often come and they would bring kind of bundles of fabric and they would use them to forge wonderful connections across geography and time. Um, and in our living room on the mantelpiece was this picture and it showed, it's actually my Uncle Archie on the far left-hand side and in the centre is Kwame Nkrumah, Ghana's very first president. And he's on the podium on the very eve of, en of independence. And I once asked my father why this picture particularly was the only one that actually sat on the mantle. And then he told me this story about this picture, about the evening when it was taken. You could imagine being in the audience. Now there are shouts of, of silence, and the, the shouts are utterly ignored. And there's an occasional kind of stern shush from the front of the audience. But people aren't going to stop. The celebrations continued. And every now and then, there's a kind of momentary lull. And you think, you know, it's going to be the moment in which they begin the speeches. But then laughter erupts again. And there's calls and, and, and screams and shouts. And the echoes out beyond this space across Accra, which is the capital of Ghana, right across the heart of the city. After years, decades, petitioning, generations of campaigning. This is the evening of the 6th of March, 1957. And it's the culmination of 
a process of bills, of legal deputations, of congresses, of coalitions, of lost lives, of broken hearts, of setbacks and sacrifice. And the wait is now at, the, at an end. This is the close of a chapter of African colonial history in which hundreds of thousands of people were forcibly enslaved, millions killed in wars of re and resistance struggles. And the continent's population had been put to work to fuel the empire machine. And although international business had colluded in the reconfiguration, the fundamental reconfiguration of the continent's interests, industries to the benefit of others, though the world had turned an utter blind eye on the systematic undermining and the dissolution of the cultural infrastructure. Here, in a few brief minutes, the axis of the commercial and political interests is going to be turned, and a new story would begin. And then from the darkness at the side of the stage emerge half a dozen men, at first, they're completely silhouetted by the light. And then at the top of a truly rickety podium, they find the light and the crowd roar. And then, for the very first time that evening, there's utter silence. Colony, a continent, a new nation's inhalation of breath. And then the words begin one of the most important passages of oratory ever uttered on African soil. At long last, our battle has ended. This is the first president of Ghana, the first president of a sub-Saharan independent country. And in the front row is Vice President Nixon, Martin Luther King, the Duchess of Kent and the Soviet Union, they've sent a telegram, an open invitation to the first sub-Saharan African leader. But Kwame Nkrumah, he's not interested in any of them. He stares out beyond them all. He's not here to court the world's powers. He wants to renegotiate his continent's relationship with itself. As he would define it, this was not just about political and, and economic and constitutional rebirth. This was a moment of spiritual renaissance, a moment in which he's going to reveal a new national anthem, a new flag, new cultural optimism. Here's independent Ghana. It's not going to look east, it's not going to look west, but toward a new destiny, a new future. And that's what he wants his nation's greatest ally to be. It's charting its own relationship between the past and the future. And now Martin Luther King, who's sitting in the front, he describes this as a new order coming into being, of the universe being on the side of justice. And so, Krumah stands on the stage and he says, we have a duty to demonstrate to the world that we can manage our own affairs. We must set an example to the whole of Africa. And that podium shakes with his passion. And now on this night, I mean, this is a historic night with people watching all over the world. And the men at the heart of this pioneering moment, they aren't dressed by Savile Row. On this momentous evening, they have chosen to dress themselves in the cloth of their new beautiful nation, Ghana. So they are wearing agbadas, dashikis, bubus. These are clothes of their African forefathers. They, like most people of African descent, they understood the power of clothing, the potency, the importance 
of fashion to peoples of colour, of how our clothing, our fashion, our choices so often stood as the only material witnesses when our voices were silenced. Fashion stood as a powerful, palpable record of our pride, our dignity, our defiance, when non-compliance felt right but was unwise. And there are very few, a tiny number, a special few who understand that heritage, what it means to us, that pain, that complexity, and who are also possessed with the rare skill to craft it into exquisite style, who can also give it the needed catharsis. So I am utterly delighted to be here, to be here to celebrate with you and to be in conversation with one of the great fashion designers and cultural thinkers in this, of this com complex moment, Grace Wells Bonner. And her work is part of a very special tradition of deeply thoughtful textiles and fashion design that have transcended the medium, changing the way in which we think about the possibilities of what we wear. These are works that thoughtfully connect peoples across geography and history in a beautiful kind of implied defiance. Now, fashion's a powerful thing and made all the more powerful when deployed by those like Grace, who obviously love and understand the importance of its history. And I think this is the perfect place to be engaged in these kinds of conversations in Dundee in Scotland, in a city, a nation that's history itself is so palpably connected to ethnically emblematic fabric, a nation that understands the connection between cloth and narrative, between textile and strong identity. And like so many African cultures, remembering, connecting in the face of sus substantive challenge, remembering through libation through the cup of kindness and in the spirit of respectfully acknowledging remembering i'd also like to thank everyone at the vna dundee who've worked to bring us together this evening and to the sponsors of this evening dalmore who've understood in all they do the essence of what we're gathered to discuss this evening the importance of togetherness history of sharing, of community, of how spirit and essence of a people can be distilled through thoughtful creative in intervention, through beautiful narrative into a community's beautiful quintessence. So I'll stop talking there because the main bill is Grace. And I want to begin, Grace, by asking you a little bit about your career and how it began. You know, I'm particularly, I think particularly for younger people who may um, get the chance to listen to this, you know, tell us a little bit about your first chapter. Well, thank you for your beautiful words, Gus. That's really um, touching. And I think the way that you've kind of, um, expanded an idea of temporality and how kind of threads run across time is is really um interesting and important theme in my work so i'm glad that you kind of touched upon that um so i i think i had quite a slow route to fashion in a way i i was interested in history and identity while i was um at school and also art so i i, I kind of had these separate interests and it was either um, going to art college or, or going to study history. And I thought I'll, I'll apply to St. Martin's and um, because that seemed like the best place to, to go uh, as an art college. And if I don't get in, I'll, I'll think about studying history. And I think over the course of my time at Central St. Martin's, starting on the foundation and then the BA, I, I realized that I could marry both my interests and I focused on um, exploring identity and representation whilst um, at 
central St. Martin. So also developing um, my thinking about around um, black aesthetics and rhythmicality and how those things can be quite intertwined. So I, I'd kind of established a, a language of, of exploring that um, through my dissertation. And then at the same time, I was uh, working on a collection called Afrique, uh, which was exploring this kind of turning point in representations in, in the 70s and thinking about uh, photographers like Malik Sidibe, uh Seydou Keita, but also thinking about black exploitation films um, in America of, of that time and this idea of turning the the lens uh, on on yourselves and, and taking ownership for your own representation. So that kind of uh, framework um, for control and how you're depicted inspired that initial collection um, and subtly um, a lot of the critical thinking um, into what was became interwoven into the, into the garments and it was almost more of a subconscious um, thing but when I graduated people saw those connections and, and kind of contextualised my work um, in, in a unique way so I was quite encouraged from early on after graduating that um, I'd found an interesting kind of way of combining two things so I, was, I felt quite supported in in, in leaving um, school and starting my label Wells Bonner which was in 20 I graduated in 2014 and started Wells Bonner in 2015 um, but even then it was quite a personal project I, I wasn't necessarily thinking I was starting a business I was, I was continuing some kind of intellectual study and almost extending my uh, time at university and I didn't know how how it would be received but I I, th I do feel quite lucky in that people were willing to think about a way of talking about my work from early on that acknowledged the kind of multiplicity and and the cultural perspective that was integrated in in what I was doing so that was encouraging to begin with and I found you know fa fashion for me feels like a really direct mode of communication um creating imagery can I think so much can be held so much emotion can be held in in imagery and in, in cloth um that's very immediate and and people can interpret that um on a gestural level or a subconscious level and they can understand the depth of where I'm coming from without having to read critical theory. So I think I found that quite interesting that you could have a very direct mode of communication and people could feel what I was doing. So that that was when kind of fashion became really exciting for me as a as a mode of communication. And, and in that period, what were the points of inspiration that you began to to, to draw upon? So with my, I mean, with my graduate collection entitled Afrique, I mentioned it was thinking about some of these um, photographers like Malik Sidibe, also thinking about black exploitation, but also I wanted to create a, a hybrid or an idea of luxury that that encompasses um, European ideals of beauty, but also um, an Afro-Atlantic perspective. So I was also looking at Coco Chanel and trying to create something that felt like a, a hybrid and also thinking about what ideas of luxury mean in different cultural contexts so um I, I i started to work a lot with cowrie shells to begin with which is also a form of currency so thinking about kind of cultural currency and, and what signifies um that in different contexts so it was about kind of trying to merge these two things um and then my next collection uh, was called abonics and it was very much uh it was more ex expansive in a way and thinking about um, intonation, black intonation and, and poetry. And I think that collection is also about how, how would you recognize someone um, to be black by the sound of their voice? And, and in, in that sense, uh, it had a, a connection to poetry and literature and the Harlem Renaissance. So I think that a thread of poetry and there being a wider framework around um the collections i was presenting uh was all already quite apparent 
in in very early collections and i think i think another intention uh with that kind of first collection i did after uh, leaving school was um to represent a a broad spectrum of blackness and to to kind of not resolve into one image and one representation it was very much about um presenting infinite possibilities and ways of being and ways of being seen so i think that also sets something up which is that um it, my work is not about singular narrative i'm influenced by a chorus of voices but also um my idea of representation is also allowing for kind of fluidity and um conflict and kind of um it's not there's not a, a purity to it it's actually much more about showing the possibilities and 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 being uh consistent about that over time as well um but i think that i think the consistency comes from exploring that idea of beauty that i think is is consistent over time and and kind of revealing many examples and instances that we're probably quite familiar with um in culture and over time but maybe haven't haven't been represented within a fashion context so it was about kind of um just revealing the depth of beauty that exists um and in multiple places um across across time so it was so that was a kind of starting point for how I, how I started to think about collections and characters or, or moments um, that would repeat um, over time. And, and what was the reaction? Because it's, it, it, it's a radical kind of um, project, but also the, the clothes feel, they feel so different and yet at the same time so timely. What was the reaction, both from from press, but also from friends and other designers? Well, I think what was really um, special about when I first started designing is I was working really closely with friends. So a lot of my muses would be friends and um, and who'd also be my models and be in the shows. So there was quite an intimate dialogue with um, with them, with, the, with with some of the models I was working with about how the clothes made them feel and um i actually kind of developed the collections in that dialogue um and so for me what i was representing was something that was very familiar because it, it came out of these conversations and i was i was expressing the beauty or um something that i found familiar um with with the models that I was exchanging with um so for me it, it the world I was exploring didn't feel um alien it felt very natural it was like thinking about the men in my life or thinking about my um father or um my fr my friends and so I had these images of people in mind um that I was very close to and so the world felt close and intimate um so I was quite surprised. People did find it quite shocking, um, quite arresting. And uh, but for me, it was like I, I'd seen it coming, but also it felt very familiar and I think relatable to people also of my generation. So um, I found it strange that the idea of kind of idealized, idealized idea of beauty that was shocking. Like that was actually kind of a bit uh, concerning to me that showing um a more myriad expression of uh, blackness was kind of shocking in some way um and i think that the time that i started um designing feels quite a different time to to now where at that moment the models that um you know black models that are working in the industry had quite like an athletic build and it was quite a quite a specific and small um representation of, of blackness within fashion and um since then you know i was also friends with you know street cast people friends with being part of the show and actually the industry now is a lot more expansive um so 
I was reacting to something, a, a, a lack of representation at that moment. But I feel like um, things have evolved in the sense as other designers also representing their heritage and then fashion, it feels like a different landscape. So within that, my narrative kind of evolves also. Could you speak a little bit about the um, the trilogy collection, which is absolutely one of the you know the lovers rock essence black sunlight that trilogy of collections which uh, were kind of that's when for me I kind of began to really begin to think about how different and how brilliant as a designer Grace Wells Bonner. Is and I, I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. I think um, part of the idea of um, exploring a theme over time, um, over three collections, was also me reacting to the cycle of fashion, knowing that every six months I'm creating a new collection. So I was thinking, how can I stretch time and how can I give the sense of depth and thinking? Um, create that framework for myself to be able to explore deeper to get con continue to tell a story um and so that collection was exploring more connections between um britain and the caribbean the british diaspora in um british caribbean diaspora um at, which is very close to my um upbringing um and where some of the other collections are more kind of framing things in a broader context. This was looking at um, music, but also um, the first collection, Lover's Rock, um, was looking at the genre of Lover's Rock um, that came out of Britain in the 70s. Um, and um, I think that was that was kind of interesting because the clothing was so interwoven with the uh, musical genre and the lifestyle. Everything was very integrated. Um, but looking at um, people of Caribbean descent in Britain um, at that time, the way that, uh, and then I was also looking at people in Jamaica at the same time and, and looking at how clothing changed and within in looking at photographs like uh van liebert photographs at, at birmingham or looking at uh, photographs in london manchester um it seemed like um the way that identity was represented or connections to home were represented in britain were very what well, it was very strong and bold and it kind of um there was a real sh strong um intention to represent where you where you come from uh, in the way that people dressed and and then looking at um the essence collection which is the next collection looking at kind of the early origins of dance or music um at a similar period just looking at the kind of wardrobe what elements also seem to be borrowed from like a british wardrobe or um in that in that space how does the clothing change or, or what's consistent so i think it was just interesting looking at um people in different places really and and the final collection um black sunlight was um inspired by this book about black oxford and the um history of people um from all over the diaspora coming to the uk for education um and and their kind of presence in britain for a long time and and i was thinking about both in an institution like Oxford, but also how people from different places came to Britain and formed their own academic circles, whether that's within an institution or in a more community um, setting. Um, and, and then thinking about this idea of the, the black intellectual and the black intellectual wardrobe, which is, which is another idea that has come up in other collections. So one collection I did, um, called Mumbo Jumbo, which was presented at the Serpentine um, alongside my exhibition there, was looking at Howard University um, and that kind of academic wardrobe. Um, and this time I was looking at, um, you know, writers like 
Derek Walcott, Kamal Braithwaite. Um, yeah, just start, start, start starting to see these consistencies in, in in a wardrobe. And that's kind of how I start collections really is looking at a wardrobe and looking at what things repeat itself, what themes repeat themselves, um, whether that, that's a garment or whether that's a colour or um, a texture. So there is quite a studious way of kind of observing certain things. Um, and I think maybe it also comes from looking at menswear and, and tailoring. There is kind of some kind of formality and rules about dressing. So I think it is possible to kind of extract things in that way. And, and what was it like seeing your, your clothes in a gallery setting? What was it like actually working in, 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 uh, with the serpentine in that way? Well, I mean, what was really special about that um, opportunity is I was able to create an exhibition that tied together many threads and influences, um, exploring ideas of um, spirituality and mysticism and the idea of the shrine um, in Afro-Atlantic cultures. And so I'd, I'd kind of created a physical environment that brought together many the themes of the collection um and then i was creating the characters that inhabit that environment so thinking about these either the, the black intellectual or this idea of the artist as shaman which was another character i had in in mind and, and the different wardrobes so that that was quite um special like the special gathering of people of different generations um and yeah, it's just very special. It almost felt like kind of walking through my mind in a way, that exhibition and that, that shape of the exhibition as well. So I think, you know, it just shows that the clothes exist in a much wider context and honouring what's come before and the kind of lineage and the people that have created possibilities for me to create is, is a very important part of that. Um, but also, I think in terms of extending my research practice, um where i'm often inspired by literature um and that exhibition you know, some of the starting points were um ishmael reed's writing mumbo jumbo um or ben okri's the famished road these kind of magical realist texts um i also had to have you know having dialogues with these um writers and artists that their, their thinking's very much evolved from from that point in that moment of creating and and so it the kind of back and forth of, of that dialogue and expanding what something can be with multiple ways of looking was really um exciting and important part of how i work but also how a multiplicity of perspectives is very, very important to to not creating something that's reductive so a lot of my work's also created in collaboration with with other people and created in dialogue and spring summer 22 i know that the collection called volta jazz i mean where, where did that theme come from and can you talk a little bit about it so that was my last collection and the it, it's interesting that the more recent collections like black sunlight which is the last of the trilogy which placed my design in a more post-colonial context looking at kind of post-colonial writers and then sh showing how what i'm trying to create is within that lineage in design um this this collection also volta jazz feels like it speaks to a lot of themes that are really important in my work um music and the um, communities and cultures around music uh, is something that comes up a lot because I'm always interested in this idea of a rhythmical expression or um, I always find it an interesting challenge like how can you uh, embed something with a sense of rhythm it's like kind of an impossible thing uh, aesthetically but I'm always coming back to that and also looking at artists that um, do so in their work and Volta Jazz was uh, inspired by the music um, made in Burkina Faso in the 70s um, 
and a photographer called Sorry Sanle who uh, photographed the genre of music and these outdoor um, parties. Um, and also his cousin was in the band Volta Jazz. So he, he had a, an amazing record of all this um, music and style of, of this time. And I think, you know, I rely on photographic records to have an understanding of um, a time. So there was something about that, like the records, the musical records, but also these photographic records and how they help you to understand a moment in time, but we're also connected to these yeah, traditions of documenting um, yourself or kind of preserving your own image. Um, that was that was really important. So so it was speaking to this tradition of portraiture and how um, important it is really to represent, to kind of control your own representation. And, and the ways that, no, sorry, because it, it seems quite abstract, but the ways that I might interpret um, something like that theme or, or, or that portraiture might be um, looking at certain uh, fabrications or materials um, and trying to get a feeling of like a party outside at, at dusk, what that would feel like in clothing, uh, in, in fabric. And so that, that collection was really much, the fabric was kind of trying to create that um, mood where it wasn't necessarily about the silhouettes. It was about how can you give that quality of, of movement and lightness in fabrics and you know fabrics for a certain climate as well it's so glorious talking to you grace just so evocative and it's and i see your clothes and i i i kind of read in them things that feel so comfortable and familiar to me and it's just wonderful to listen to you in the way in which you can convey so much more but it's just wonderful Can you tell me just as a last question um the future because you've achieved so much so quickly i mean could you tell me you know what, what what are your plans and your hopes and desires for the future i think i've realized that um there's different rhythms that i can work in and fashion has a certain rhythm and, and cycle um but there's other things like an exhibition which would maybe be a three-year lead time as opposed to six months so for me it's about creating the right frameworks to explore subjects in the right format um whether that's releasing a record um of you know archival music or creating an exhibition or creating a collection so i think i'm creating these different yeah, frameworks to express different ideas and for people to relate to the ideas in different ways. Um, so that's kind of what I'm focusing on really. And, you know, I want to create a cultural brand. So it's, um, yeah, there's multiple ways of expressing that. So that's kind of, the exercise um, and on the other side there's my research practice which I see as a kind of artistic and, and spiritual practice um, in its own right so creating space for that to exist that kind of research archiving practice to exist independently of other outputs like I think I think that's really important for me is to have the research process doesn't need to have an outcome it can be an artistic expression in its own own right and there can be physical outputs of course but to value that process and to that that kind of exploration process is um important so just creating space for all these important things to exist over time as well so i'm not in a rush it's so such a pleasure to speak to you grace and you are such a source of inspiration to so many and getting a sense of not just this span of time in which you've produced such exquisite, exquisite clothes, but so many rich 
deep, thoughtful connections, but also to gain a, an insight into the incredible well of of research and learning that you actually um, mine to deliver your incredible collections. It's just been an utter pleasure and a privilege, Grace. And thank you so much for joining us from Barcelona. And I can't wait to, um, to, to, to see your, your next collection because listening to you speaking to that tonight has only whetted my appetite further. Thank you so much, Grace. Just an absolute inspiration and a pleasure. Thank you very much. Grace and Gus, um, I think what, you, what you've all just heard, I think coming to V&A Dundee tonight in the week that we turned three, at an event and a talk sponsored by our, our brilliant partners, the Dalmore, a conversation between Gus and Grace, actually, if one looks at that, they can seem like quite disparate elements of something. But we wanted to try something that actually was brought together, I guess, by a concept, and that concept was time. And that relates to the process of whiskey making and to land and community too. And that's not just something that's of Scotland, but that is something that is global. And that although we're very much an organisation of and for Scotland as V&A Dundee, we also want to, to, I think, to draw and reach out and I use that word, ra radiate in a really positive way um, around, around the world and to reflect on, on how... I, lo I loved actually what Grace said at the end there about her being in no rush. Um, <laughs> and you've online... You've, you've given us such patience tonight by bearing with us as we dealt with some technological issues. Our team have been under pressure. Our audience with us in V&A Dundee have also been patient with us. And actually, we as an organisation through COVID, we have been under pressure and we have worked at pace. And actually, I think there's something so wise in the young voice of Grace that we need to just think about what we're rushing. And actually, I think when we think, hear Gus talking about that extended view of his own family history. And he did a really, really lovely thing that we didn't pay him to do there, where he kind of made a nod to an upcoming show that we're all working on for our fifth birthday in 2023 called Tartan, about just how much time it also takes to develop real meaning and to generate real value. And we thought that was a really nice pairing with our partnership with Dalmore and just how whiskey draws on the history of the lands of Scotland and also its water to become this kind of wonderful, exquisite drink that we then use to celebrate, to be together, but also to, to grieve. And um, we felt that that kind of felt right for the times that we we are, are living in. So I just like to end, end, end this bit of the evening, I suppose, by, by thanking Gus and Grace, because um, I think actually hearing two people talk like that is a really intimate experience and one that we don't often um, actually get the privilege to do. So thank you for being so intimate with us tonight. That it, it, it was moving and actually, Grace, it was remarkable to hear the depth of your knowledge and how you express it through your through your clothing. And we can't wait to meet you in real life when you're back from, from Barcelona. But I'd also really like to thank our to Dalmore, our partners tonight. Um, I've been talking about how young and, and full of energy and optimism we are as an organisation just being three, but our partnership with Dalmore is also is also young it's also only just begun so over the next few years we will continue to work with Dalmore to to shine a light on on the rich creativity that has been in Scotland over centuries some of which relates to our landscapes and our natural environment but some that is breaking through from unexpected places and that is very imaginative and innovative so we keep working with Dalmore on that so thank you Dalmore for for working with us in that way to showcase creativity and craft and to expand our minds to think about time slightly differently. Thank you. <laughs>